Chapter 15. Now in Jamestown, they were all in combustion, the strongest preparing once more to run away with the pinnace for England. William Simmons ed the proceedings. The discovery bobs in the river as the gentlemen on board unfurled the, her sails. There is no wind yet, but their intent is clear. They have loaded up all of our food, and as soon as the breeze lifts, they will set sail for England. There are 10 or 12 gentlemen on board, and they are leaving the 25 of us commoners behind to starve. In, two, in twos and threes, men come out from the fort to stare at the discovery. I'll shoot them all, one of the soldiers declares. He prepares to load his musket. Don't be stupid, Henry says. They'll shoot you before you can fire a second shot, and they'll hit some of the rest of us as well. They've already killed us, says John Layden. You think we'll make it through the winter? The river will freeze over our fish nets. The birds are already gone, and there's nothing more to harvest. We might as well be shot. At least it'll be a quick death. My stomach grumbles for its breakfast. I wonder how long it takes to die of hunger. I wonder if it hurts. The men continue to argue. Some think we'll be able to trade with the Indians, and others insist the Indians will not trade now in midwinter when they are probably going half hungry themselves. Many want to kill the gentleman or die trying. Reverend Hunt is standing near me. He is staring out at the ship, his face set in grim lines. It is all lost, Reverend. I ask him, are we doomed? He puts his hand on my shoulder. Do you see any wind? He asks. I take a good look at the surface of the river. There is hardly a ripple. I shake my head. The discovery is not going anywhere yet. There is time for me to pray for a miracle. He walks off in the direction of the fort to the chapel. I listen to the men argue about how to shoot, to kill, the most gentlemen at once. Richard touches my arm. His eyes are bright. Look, he whispers, pointing back behind us. At first, I think I'm seeing a vision that my imagination is playing tricks. I see a dozen native men emerging from the forest near the fort. Some are bare-chested despite the cold, and some have deerskin mantles thrown over one shoulder. They are walking quickly. There is one man among them who is not quite a native, though not quite a white man either. His hair was reddish brown but long and shaggy he is wearing a deerskin mantle and also slops and shoes suddenly it is as if my eyes clear and i know who i am seeing captain smith i cry and run full speed to greet him everyone starts clamoring at once they're leaving us they've stolen our food we've no stores left those no good lazy gentlemen will starve where have you been captain smith holds up his hand to silence us help me with the cannons he orders we follow him to the fort, and our soldiers work to load the cannons and aim them squarely at the discovery. Then Captain Smith marches down to the water's edge. Halt or be sunk, he shouts. Disembark at once or die. We watch as the gentlemen on board the ship huddle and talk. After a few mo minutes, a few minutes um, of conferring with one another, Master Archer shouts out, Where are Jahu Robinson and Thomas Emery? Captain Smith shakes his head. Dead, he answers. Killed by the savages. The gentlemen confer some more and then begin to load the long boat with provisions to bring back to shore. A cheer goes up among the commoners. Our food is being returned to us, but I have an uneasy feeling. Why did the gentlemen change their minds as soon as Captain Smith told them that those two men are dead? I watched them paddle the long boat toward shore and think it almost feels too easy this change in their plans we turn our attention to count smith with a hundred questions where did you go why did you stay away so long did you bring corn did the indians try to kill you later he says i will tell you all about it later the group of native men who have come with captain smith stand quietly watching as the gentlemen roll barrels of provisions up the river bank once the discovery has been unmanned captain smith turns back toward the fort Payaquana, he says to the native men. And I means to go with him, I say to Richard. Richard and I follow too. Captain Smith brings the men to the fort where two of our cannons sit perched on the artillery platform. Uh, he speaks to them in Algonquin as, much, as best as he can. Here, guns I promise to Great Powhatan, you take to him. My jaw drops open. We are forbidden to give the Indian Indians muskets or swords, but Captain Smith is giving them cannons. The Indian men 
gather around one of the cannons to lift it. They strain, switch positions, team up, push and pull with all their might. Their faces turn red, veins on their necks stand out, and they sweat despite the icicles hanging from the trees. We glance over at Captain Smith and see what he is stifling a smile. I give something easy for Carrie, he offers. The would-be cannon carriers look relieved. They finally leave with handfuls of intricately colored glass beads, some bells, small mirrors, and a large copper pot. I wonder if the great Powhatan will be satisfied with the switch. Now, will you tell us where you've been? John Layden asks, Did you really meet the great Powhatan, I ask? Can't a man get breakfast before he has to give an oration, Captain Smith says? Richard and I fill the half-full barrel of corn and cook up a large pot of hominy. After breakfast, we keep the common cook fire going so we can warm ourselves while Captain Smith tells his story. Most of the common men come to listen. The gentlemen are, again, nowhere to be seen. Are they off sulking like scolded dogs, I wonder, or hatching a new plan? But once Captain Smith begins the story, I don't give the gentlemen another thought. Two hundred savages came upon me, he says. They captured me and took me prisoner. They paraded me from one village to another, and at each village there were ceremonies and dancing, with dancers painting red and, painted red and black like fearsome devils, and there was feasting, lots of feasting. I was sure that as soon as I was fed enough for their liking, they would kill me and eat me. I thought the Powhatans were not cannibals, I blurred out. Captain Smith shakes his head. I don't think so, but why else were they fattening me up? He raised his eyebrows at me. Finally, I was taken to the village of Wirawakamako. I was presented to Wahangsanakak, the great Powhatan himself. He sat on a throne covered with a large robe made of raccoon skins with a tail still on. All around him sat his court, upwards of 200 men and women, their faces and shoulders painted red and crowns of white bird feathers on their heads. They had another feast, and then two large stones were brought in place in front of Chipahan. Captain Smith pantomimes lifting two heavy stones. Suddenly, seven or eight warriors jump up from their seats and seized me. They dragged me over and forced my head down on one of the stones. Three warriors stood over me with heavy clubs. They raised the clubs, ready to bash my brains out. I suck in my breath. Henry looks at me and rolls his eyes. Well, he didn't get his brains bashed out. Now did he, he says. I glare at Henry and go back to listening. There was no way for me to escape. With so many men holding me down, I could not even move, Captain Smith says. I prepared to die. We are silent, waiting for the next turn in the story. Suddenly, I heard the voice of a child begging for my life to be spared. But Chief Powhatan refused the request. He declared, no, the Englishman will die. Then I saw who had been speaking. It was a little girl, about nine or ten years old. She came running over to me. She ignored the warriors with her raised clubs. She gathered my head in her arms and laid her head, her own head down over mine. The warriors could not strike a blow now without hitting her first. We are amazed by what we have heard. After a moment, Henry breaks a silence. Well, I don't believe it, he says. You made it all up. You did. Captain Smith is on his feet in a second. He catches Henry up by the front front of his shirt that little girl has more courage than you will ever have and don't you ever call me a liar again henry cowers yes sir he says i want the story to continue but just then president ratcliffe master martin master archer and a few of the other gentlemen come crowding into our circle several of them grab captain smith and hold him fast we are too stunned to do anything what is going on here captain smith bellows he thrashes at the men but they jerk his arm Arms behind his back, tie his hands together and clamp chains around his ankles. Stop this, John Layden cries. He lifts his musket, but it is beaten out of his hands by Master Archer. Watch yourself, or you'll face the gallows as well, Master Archer warns. The gallows? You are under arrest, Master Archer announces. The law of Leviticus states an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. You are responsible for the deaths of Thomas Emery and Jehu Robinson, and they were... In your care, you will pay for those deaths with your life. Your execution will be at sun up tomorrow. Captain Smith struggles, but he is tight, tied so tightly, hand at foot and foot, that he can hardly move. You're mad, he cries. There is no English law that makes me responsible for those deaths. But the gentlemen don't listen. They drag him away, his chains clanking. Rage bubbles up inside me. 
Without thinking, I snatch up a rock and hurl it straight at the back of Master Archer's head. Master Archer howls. He grabs his bleeding scalp and turns to look at us. I stand there, seething with anger. I feel the old urges, the desire to punch and rip, to see blood before my fury is spent. Captain Smith's voice speaks in my head. Learn to channel your anger, Samuel, and it will become your strength rather than your weakness. I know what you're doing, Henry is saying. They're, they'll kill Captain Smith, and then they'll go ahead and sail away and leave us to starve. Channel my anger. No, I can't stop myself. I run at Master Archer. I will knock him down and pummel the snot out of him.